And we're live once again. Welcome to the MongoDB Podcast Live. Once again, going live to talk about software development, databases, all things tech. Thank you so much for joining me today. We've got a very special guest, Divyesh from Drone HQ, is going to be joining us. We're going to talk about low code solutions, making use of the data that you have to develop uh, great internal tools and interfaces. Uh, he's going to give you all the details about how Drone HQ works. So I'm really excited about that. As you're coming into the stream, let me know where you're coming from and what your interest is in low-code solutions. Are you using some low-code solution today or are you building things from scratch using boilerplate code, writing stuff from, from scratch can be a real challenge. I know I spent many years doing this in the financial services industry and really just love the idea of being able to use a platform to uh, really accelerate the process of developing things from scratch. So uh, love to know where you're coming from and what you're interested in low code, low code solutions is for today. Welcome, Cater and Anish. Good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us today. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Divyesh onto, on the, onto the stage. Divyesh, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you on the show. How are you today? Hi, Mike. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm doing perfect. Uh, looking forward to chat with you today. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks so much for taking time to talk to us today. I'm really excited to learn more about Drona HQ. But before we do that, where where in the world are you, Divyesh? So I am in uh, Mumbai, India. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a little evening right now for me. Yeah. But um, happy to see everyone excited about, you know, listening about how Drona HQ works with you know, MongoDB yeah. and how we can build applications as well. Yeah, yeah. And I understand you're going to show some some stuff too. We're going to be actually be able to see the, the platform in action, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. Well, as folks are coming in, um, let's let's dive into your background. How did you get uh, get involved in founding Drone HQ? Sure. So uh, like uh, every other Indian on the planet, you know, I did my engineering uh, into tech and uh, worked with a few companies. Uh, you know, before you know, we started getting into the world of uh, you know software for developers, right? So that's mm -hmm. where we first you know started with. Uh, we, we we used to provide uh, software for developers, you know, to build software, right? So an SDK to build applications. And while you know, when, while we were doing that with a lot of customers, we we kind of figured out that you know the kind of applications uh, the developers or customers were building you know, using our SDK were mostly internal tooling, internal applications uh, for their partners, for their employees, you know, uh, B2B customers, close set of customers, and so on and so forth. Uh, and these applications, we were able to kind of you know understand you know what are these applications? They were mostly Know, dashboards, uh, forms, uh, you know, CRUD applications, a lot of these, you know, things that, you know, their operational needs were, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, then we started thinking, you know, why not, you know, why only stop at an SDK? Why not give a whole full-fledged platform where, you know, the developers could actually accelerate, you know, without writing a lot of front-end code, right? And mm -hmm. most of these developers were, you know, back-end developers. They could, you know, quickly write uh, database queries very fast. But they struggled, you know, building front end with, with a lot of these frameworks that were coming out, right? And that's where we we kind of stepped into the world of uh, low code platform to kind of stitch the whole story together to build applications faster. Yeah. So you started with an SDK, and I love <laughs> I love the idea of not having to start from scratch, especially when it comes to front ends. I mean, you do the same thing over and over again. You know, I'm I'm thinking of the last internal tools that I built. It's it's essentially the same thing over and over again. It's it's a table or grid where I click on a row and I expose a detail panel. It's that that the uh, the same old thing over and over again. And it's so valuable because you've got all of this data. I mean, data is key, but you need to be able to get access to it and maintain it. And uh, starting from scratch is just arduous and takes so much time. So I'm excited to see Drona HQ. I did have the opportunity to dive into the platform. And uh, I got started for free and connected up my sample database from MongoDB. And within a couple of minutes, I had a full, fully functional uh, maintenance application. And, and it looks 
fantastic. So how long has it taken you to build Jonah HQ? Yeah, so uh, we basically built it on top of the SDK itself, right? Which we which we right. already had, uh, but it took us good uh, you know, two years, uh, one and a half to two years to actually get into beta, uh, to actually put it you know generally available to most of the customers uh, mm -hmm. that we already had as well uh, before, uh, and and over a period of time it has been you know adding a lot more connectors, adding a lot more database support, adding a lot more you know, components and controls, uh, a lot more features around those, you know, governance features and so on and so forth. So it's, 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 it's been three, four years now uh, mm -hmm. that, that we've been building on top of it, listening to customers, listening to all their feedback, and going back and forth uh, to the drawing board and, you know, getting it, uh, you know, out in front of them. Yeah, yeah. So you've gotten some good feedback and it's on a continuum. The, the, the major components of the platform that I, I really like, and the, I mean, absolutely essential for a low code solution, I, I want to be able to seamlessly connect the data that I have, you know, so, so launching right in, being able to connect multiple data sources. I mean, MongoDB is great, but uh, folks are typically running MongoDB and some other database. So I'd love to be able to, to connect up multiple data sources. And then I want a drag and drop interface where I can take you know, usual components that, that I'm used to, like a table grid, like buttons, like, um, like tabs. And, and I found all of that stuff to be very easy to use right in the platform. So, um, so kudos for that. What is the, what is the tool built in? Yeah. So, um, uh, in terms of tech that we've used to build it, you know, uh, of course we're using a lot of MongoDB in the backend for us as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we're using a relational DB as well. Uh, uh, we're using more or less Node.js uh, to serve most of our you know, backend stuff. And uh, on the front end, we are using a little bit of React along with uh, a lot of you know, vanilla JavaScript as well. Okay. Uh, to dig really deep down into each experience on the front end that you would want to provide uh, to the customers. A lot yeah. of you know, vanilla JavaScript as well. Okay. Terrific. So why don't we jump in? Do you want to show the folks what Drona HQ looks like? Sure, sure, sure. So let me uh, share my screen. Uh, you can okay. kind of fill it up. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Drona HQ basically is, you know, uh, uh, mo two or three major pillars. Uh, of course, there are a lot more things that we can we can go through. But two or three major you know, pillars that you see. The first one is the application dashboard that you are currently seeing. These are all the apps uh, that you can build. Now, these apps could be uh, web applications, mobile applications, responsive applications, all of these, right? Uh, and what I'm showing you is the creator view, right? So there are two views. One is a creator view. One is an end user view. So uh, on a creator view, I am I'm playing the role of uh, a creator or a developer who's going to create these applications and going to list them out here. Uh, the second uh, section to it is the connectors, right? And any application is nothing without the data that you kind of tap in, right? So this is the place where you actually, you know, connect to any of your data sources. Now, in terms of data sources, we essentially, you know, divide the data sources into three major uh, components, right? One is a raw database. It could be uh, something like a Postgres, MongoDB, and so on and so forth. Uh, second is uh, the second category of uh, data sources are APIs. So it could be a REST API, a GraphQL, a gRPC, a Google PubSub, and so on and so forth. And the third category is you know ready uh, connectors to uh, third-party applications. So it could be Airtable, it could be Google Sheets, it could be Slack, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So you could connect any of those data sources and uh, bring them all together to build your applications. Now, when you connect your data sources, you can go ahead and you know utilize them uh, into uh, an application builder interface like this. Right? So this is a sample built application. Uh, this was built probably in uh, an hour and a half. Uh, you know where you could just drag drop and build these you know, components, and you can connect to data sources. Now, when you when you come on this screen, right? So uh, you we basically give you a whole interface building uh, uh, skill, right? So let's say you want to build multi-screen applications, you want to build pop-ups, 
around them. You want to build, build a menu on the left hand side or on top bar, uh, a drawer or a tray and, and so on and so forth. Right? And any application uh, that you want to kind of deploy for a, a huge number of audience, uh, it could be your employees as well. Uh, you need these experiences to kind of come together. And then there are controls and components which you could drag drop like a table grid, uh, a chart control, a button, uh, form controls, and, and so on and so forth, right? And once you mm -hmm. have those in place, uh, the, the heart of the application, I'll just zoom in a little, uh, is the, the, the uh, data queries, right? You could basically hook on to uh, any database, you could write JavaScript, you could open JavaScript editors at any point of time to manipulate with your data, play around with your data, get the data sorted the way you would want, mm -hmm. uh, which is the output here, and uh, then go ahead and you know bind it to the place that you would want. So a component, it, yeah. To, the, to a component, right? Yeah. And the last piece to it is you know building uh, an interactive application, right? So uh, what I showed you right now was, you know, binding data one way uh, to the application. The second is, you know, if you could you know, double click, uh, a, a way in which you could uh, you know, build a whole workflow on click of a button uh, mm -hmm. and a workflow which involves not only backend server side actions like updating a database or inserting into a database, but also on screen actions like you know, showing, showing a toast message, doing a branch logic iterations and, and so on and so forth, right? So it's it's a very powerful way to you know build these applications, you know, without actually writing a single line of you know front end code in, in React or JavaScript or you know worrying about small pixels and you know how do I do all of those. You know, it's it's purely drag and drop, connect your data, you know, build your interactions and you can you can go live. So yeah. In short, that's the whole kind of uh, a gist of uh, things that you can kind beautiful. Of do. Yeah, and it's and it looks great. It looks fantastic. Now, the the places that I've been concerned or had trouble in the past with low code solutions is in communicating data screen to screen. And I think I saw how you're handling that. You have the ability at some point to introduce interpolation and and variables. Is that correct? Right. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so it's like how you write your code at all, right? So. You know, mm -hmm. when you when you define variables, you have global variables, you have mm -hmm. you know, uh, specific variables that you have, right? So these variables or data queries, you know, that you do, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can you can basically you know write you can basically do a variable that you can pass onto the next screen or use it into a next screen, uh, or you can do any of these calls like a database call, a REST API call, you know, write JavaScript there and there itself. And you know when when you do that, you know you have all of this data that you have resident accessible across the application on on any screen that you would want. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of it is, you know, we we intelligently uh, you know see uh, which screen uh, has your data you know kind of compiled, right? So for example, you know you have let's say ten screens, uh, and the home screen is only one. So when you open the single screen. Uh, the first screen, we do not get the data uh, on the different screens or dependent on the different screens mm -hmm. for you on the page load itself or the first screen. So you mm -hmm. you get the data only of what you would, you, are, you want to kind of see. And this is a, it's a complex uh, kind of fundamental because there are there are ways in which you can depend on data on different screens as well. But we mm -hmm. intelligently write an algorithm where you know we get only that much data that the user wants to see on that screen. Uh, and that's where, you know, you are able to kind of, uh, as a developer, not worry about, you know, how do I kind of, you know, look at those kind of, uh, you know, complexities as well. Yeah, yeah. So the second area of challenge that I've, I've had with low code solutions is in the fact that it is low code or no code. And, and I, I want to be able to control some of the activity that happens in the screen. So. I think I see where you have the ability to uh, to apply JavaScript. Is that the primary language? Like if I want to break into some low code and and introduce some code of my own, is it all right. in JavaScript? Right. So currently, yes, it is in JavaScript. We are uh, about to introduce uh, ways in which you can write Python as well uh, mm -hmm. very effectively for a lot of developers. You know, a lot of feedback that we've received of you know very loyal. 
Python developers as well. But right now it is it is JavaScript. Uh, but like you said, right, the example that I mostly give to a lot of people is you know when you say low code or no code, right? I mm -hmm. give an example of cars, right? You know you have uh, a no code is basically you know uh, taking the developer out of the equation most of the times, right? It, it's saying yeah. the messaging for no code is you know you don't need a developer to build applications and you can do it without writing code at all. But that's not the, how we work, right? So for us, it's it's mostly the developer. We feel to build applications which are scalable, uh, you know, to build applications which you can deploy to you know, tons of users, production grade, serious applications, you need a developer mindset at least. Uh, of course, we are reducing the complexities of writing front-end code. But it's like, you know, it's like driving a car with you know, automatic transmission, right? Mm. To drive into the city, you don't need you know, a manual gear and a lot of control over uh, unnecessary things, right? So, so that's where you know, we, we, we think low code is where uh, the world will be moving towards. Yeah, yeah. And I can see why. So I think one of the things we kind of mm. glossed over was the power in applying multiple database connectivity to a single screen. And that's really attractive to me. I mean, many in many cases, people have multiple databases that, right. that represent the, the entirety of the, the data collection that we're trying to work with. Is the screen that we're looking at today, is that a unified data source or are there multiple databases that are backing this, this attractive dashboard? Yes, yes. So, uh, so you can see, right? So generally what happens is, you know, if you look at use cases, now you're, you know, when I actually go to data sources, you could see, you know, this is of course uh, a MySQL database, but mm -hmm. it could be it could be anything, right? So if you see uh, an automation, right? I have an API call, I have a database call, I have a MySQL call, I have a Slack. So of course this is this is a different uh, section altogether called as automations, which is like a web or cron jobs. But uh, even with a, a normal uh, system, right? You can mix and match data, and I think that's where most of our customers uh, feel the need uh, you know to have uh, that kind of a uh, kind of functionality right because every application will have multiple data sources so either yeah. they will have their tickets into some ticketing system from where they need the ticket data and then they would need to push it into their own database which could be let's say a mongodb to push customer details mm -hmm. and you know send a slack message while they are doing it or you know fire an email for us a slack Slack API call is also a data source in, in some way or the other, right? So yeah. uh, the power is, you know, you can get data from different uh, sources. You can write JavaScript, you can uh, combine them together. Uh, and not only that, right? So if I if I actually go towards, you know, let me go to one of the applications mm -hmm. uh, here. Yeah, so uh, we have something called as a DQL as well, right? Which is a drone eyes to mm -hmm. query language. Now, what that essentially gives you is it gives you a power to query uh, your JSON data. So let's say I have a MongoDB collection and I have uh, a raw data, which which I get like this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now I want to fetch invoice numbers from the payments object that I have here, right? Uh, how do I do that? I would either write a JavaScript or you know, I would write some kind of a code to do it, right? Now we are helping you. So we have something called as uh, uh, a DQL language, which is like a drone IHU query language to query mm -hmm. into your JSON, uh, complex JSON data as well, right? So if I want payments dot invoice number, it will give me an array of you know the only invoice numbers. Mm -hmm. If I say I want just the first uh, invoice that I have, it will give me only the first one, right? And and so on and so forth, right? So it's it it will help me not only you know get that data, but also conditionally get that data. I can I can do a lot more things, right? As a developer, I would want to have that control uh, on things. So so those are just a few things uh, that excites you know uh, the whole community, which kind of uses Throne HQ as well. Uh, smaller yeah. things, but larger impacts. Yeah, yeah. So I want to talk about a number of things. My, my, my mind is going crazy with a bunch of questions, but um, I want to pause and, and let the audience ask questions. Make sure that if you've got questions about what you're seeing, go ahead and put them in the comments. We'll try and get to those. 
if you're curious about how something works in the platform, go ahead and and uh, and ask a question, and we'll try and get to it. Um, on the previous screen, where we were looking at the code, you're looking at some JavaScript code. I noticed a little button that said "Ask AI." How are you leveraging AI in the platform? Yeah, so uh, a lot of times, what happens, right? So uh, you know, Ask AI is a way in which I can kind of ask. Uh, AI a way in which I want to transform my data, right? Mm -hmm. So I can say, you know, hey, you know, can I, uh, how do I get only filtered data for the month of Jan, right? And it will mm -hmm. give me a code snippet, which I can kind of use, uh, okay, it's, it's I think, I'm not using the right uh, token for this, for chat GPT, but it will give me a JavaScript code, which I can directly mm -hmm. use uh, uh, on in my JavaScript editor itself. And yeah. uh, it will basically give me a way in which I want to reach what my objective is. Right? Yeah. And so, uh, you can use your own chat GPT tokens to kind of, you know, get to that level as well. Okay, great, great. I love to see embracing AI. I think a lot of folks are they're in VS Code, they're leveraging uh, code assistance. So it's nice to see that you've got that built into the platform as well. You mentioned that um, the community. Uh, are you comfortable talking a little bit about the customers that you've got? Sure, sure. So I think in terms of customers, we have we are completely agnostic in terms of you know, the sectors that customers you know come. So we are mostly. It's it's all inbound. We have a lot of developers, customers who sign up and and use uh, right from e-commerce uh, to financial uh, technologies to uh, to manufacturing for that matter. Right. Uh, so all of these customers have very different use cases. So I'll give you one one of uh, one of the sample use case would be uh, a manufacturing of sports equipment. Right. And uh, and and I was kind of you know surprised with the kind of use cases they could kind of think of, and they had a need to which which never which those applications never saw light of the day right, uh, right from warranty applications. So let's say they they produce rackets and uh, you know they give warranty cards along with those rackets right. So right from the manufacturing setup to you know, printing uh, barcodes and QR codes on each category of uh, their SKUs uh, to, you know, connecting to a cloud printer, to issuing warranty cards, to their customer support tools for, you know, uh, addressing concerns, complaints, returns, loyalty, and so on and so forth. Right? All of these applications have been built purely on uh, their own data sets using drone ihq and used by you know different set of users inside their organization as well yeah. and it, it's surprising to see that you know those applications were lined up uh, with their cto for ages uh, but they just did not have enough engineering resources to kind of commit to you know build those uh, because we all know you know building an application is uh, you know from scratch is is a tiring process you design you write your apis you change your apis you, you build those contracts you take a front-end framework you build you test and deploy and change and so on and so forth right and it, it's 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 quite a task to you know build tons of those applications that business operations require but uh you know it's you just don't have enough kind of engineering resources to kind of you know reach that point yeah and i think that's yeah. that 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 makes me happy. That makes the whole team happy to see those applications. And we are very excited to, you know, always see the customer stories uh, that they use it for. Yeah. And so that's, that's one side of the equation. We've got the value that Drona HQ brings. I'm curious about the revenue model. Sure. The other side of the equation. Yeah. So, uh, so there are ideally there are two versions of the platform, right? So, and I'm, I'll, I'll tell you why I'm you not know, starting with the versions of the platform as well. So, one is a cloud version, which is you know the whole platform is hosted on the cloud. You connect your data sources on our cloud, and you build these applications. And that model is a pure play, you know, per uh, user kind of a model. 
Mm-hmm. And we also have a usage model there, right? So let's say you have, uh, you want to start with, with an application, which is a not very critical application. It's a very small application and you don't want to pay a very high end user fee, right? Then you go with a usage based model where the usage will be lesser. You pay as you use. And then when you build tons of applications and then you switch over to a user based model, which is more economical. Uh, so that's on the cloud, right? But uh, one of our most popular versions of the platform is uh, the on-prem or the self-hosted platform, right? Mm-hmm. Where customer can self-host uh, the whole drone IHQ platform on their own uh, premise or on their own private cloud setup. Right? Mm-hmm. And um, that is for multiple reasons. One is because they cannot open a lot of their data sources to an external cloud, security concerns, more hold on the applications that they would want to build and accessibility and so on and so forth, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, in, in which case, because they are not using a lot of our cloud resources, we are able to kind of pass on the whole benefit to them where we price or we have a business model for only developer-based pricing. So you mm-hmm. might, you know, the, the end users go uh, virtually free, but you only pay for the developers that are going to kind of develop on the platform. So. Uh, so that has been a very popular model uh, for a lot of our customers who are self-hosting uh, the platform themselves. Yeah. So Sanju has a question regarding competition. And uh, I think I know the answer, but but uh, let's ask the question. How is Drona HQ better than some of the competitors out there? Sure. So uh, I think as most of you would be knowing, we compete uh, with tools like Retool. Uh, right. So what, what generally happens is, you know, uh, we have uh, a few components which are uh, extremely, in terms of governance, we are very high. So when you look at, you know, let's say a permission model, right, I can go very extremely granular uh, in my permissions. So if I want to give a permission to a particular application, I want to give only publisher rights, I want to give editor rights only or only previewing rights only for a QA role and so on and so forth. We can go extremely granular uh, in these rights for end users. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Second is, you know, we uh, we understand that you know, all not all applications are built for all users. So I would have a range of users, right? Let's say a uh, sales, uh, I have, let's say 10 users in sales. I have five in operations, uh, two as customers and so on and so forth. And uh, we have something called as a catalog management where I can basically build a catalog for my uh, for my applications and give out only those applications for my sales audience and something else for my uh, operations, right? And I can build different catalogs for different users. So even though I'm building it as a single framework, uh, I'm able to control the access for the end users uh, basically with, with different kind of roles, right? So that's that's more on the governance accessibility side as well. Having said that, we also have a lot of more components like a PDF creator and a CMS and so on and so forth. So we understand that all of these applications that you would build, right? There are times when you need to, let's say, uh, you know, uh, roll out a receipt, uh, build a report, and you know you can't go and you know do that in an external framework as well, right? So it's just like automations or a cron jobs. Uh, or an onboard, uh, you know, database uh, for quick data, etc. For newer data, we also provide PDF, you know, uh, editors where you can generate a PDF template and generate it on the fly, and so on and so forth. Right. And having said that, the most important, you know, generally where we kind of hear from our customers where we differentiate is on the user experience for the end users, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of these applications that you will build uh, with our competition, you will find them a little more hacky for internal usage only for developers and so on and so forth. What you focused on from day one is uh, for the end user for whom you are building an application, you want to give a very you know, extremely high end uh, you know experience for the end users, uh, where every each and every component control multiple screens, navigations, the effect of navigations, you want to open the next screen left to right, top to bottom, menu, animations, mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. We've, we've, we've uh, added a lot more of those from day one, uh, which a lot of our customers you know, find it uh, you know, very attractive for you know, building end user applications that they can roll out for you know, thousands of users as well. 
Yeah, yeah. So one of the major concerns that I'm sure a lot of your customers have is around security and compliance. How are you satisfying those requirements? Sure. So, uh, yeah, so I think uh, in terms of uh, compliance, right? So we are ISO 27001 compliant. Mm -hmm. uh, we are SOC type 2 compliant. So uh, in terms of uh, having our controls in place, compliance in place, we are pretty much, pretty much there. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of security, uh, because we don't store any of the transactional data uh, that flows through our platform, we don't store it at our end at all. Uh, customers are a little more kind of, uh, you know, uh, sensitive about that data being stored at any place. Right. So we, we, we proxy through the whole data, mm -hmm. but there are two, three controls that you will, you will see, which stand out, you know, very high, uh, for us. Right. So any data, any, um, uh, so let's say we, we connect to a MongoDB, right. Or an API for that matter. So any authentication that's stored at our end is completely, you know, encrypted. Uh, so there is no way you can, uh, you know, bypass that. So every data that flows through us is, is the, the credentials are encrypted and then it goes, uh, we have tons of ways in which you can connect to your data sources, like uh, a vault management. Uh, so you can basically do a secret management like HashiCorp and then connect to your data. So you don't, you don't worry about your you know, rotating keys as, as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, having said that, you know, any data that flows from our front end to the to the back end as well uh it, it's completely time bound as well so you do you cannot uh you know uh, use the same data to do replay attacks as well right so there are a lot of there is a lot of focus that we've you know that we've spent on you know putting the security controls in place at even the smallest of places because we understand uh that it's the customer data that you know that we are dealing with though we don't store any any of it and most importantly, even audit logs, uh, even when you go to audit logs, uh, that we have, uh, let me just go there, general and security, we, we help you connect to your own favorite, uh, tools of, uh, audit logging, like, uh, you know, MongoDB, Datadog, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Sumo logic and so on and so forth, where you could push your audit log, even your audit logs, which have sensitive data to your own, uh, kind of data sources as well. Yeah. Fantastic. That's great. I'd, I'd love to see some integration with <clears throat> MongoDB charts, perhaps. Maybe that's something that uh, that's on the roadmap. That is. Yeah. You'll be happy Terrific. to know that is. Yeah, yeah. So obviously the process of, of building internal tools, it can be challenging. Drona HQ is here to help. What advice do you have for folks that are that are struggling with that, that very challenge, uh, developing internal tools to expose and manage internal data? Sure. So, uh, I think a couple of things, right? So one is, um, you know, in terms of identifying the applications, right? So not all applications, uh, we would suggest to be built on top of a low code platform, right? It's, it's still, we are still some, some few years, uh, away from, from reaching that point, right? So something like a consumer, a completely consumer facing application, like an e-commerce store, which you would probably build on a Shopify, you would not come and build on top of us, right? Mm -hmm. But so identifying those applications, right? And I think it's pretty, pretty easy, right? Uh, when we, when we speak to customers, when we speak to developers, the easiest way to identify is the backlog uh, that a CTO uh, or an engineering manager has with them. Mm -hmm. And there are tons of those applications in their backlog, uh, which, which their internal users, their internal customers have been asking, but they do not have enough uh, either motivation to do it uh, mm -hmm. or enough engineering resources to commit to those applications. Right. And I think if uh, a low code platform like us kind of, you know, enters into the scene and we are able to do the same applications with, uh, you know, 10% of the resources that they would have, right. Those are the applications ideally they should be able to identify. And I think it, uh, that's the first thing to success to that you see with, you know, low code platforms like us. Second is, you know, in case, uh, there are security concerns, right, which we mostly see and a lot of, uh, our competition is, you know, purely more so on the cloud, not yet self-hosted as well. Uh, we would, we would, uh, we suggest customers to, you know, go self-host the platform and have complete, you know, air gapped control over what they build and what they kind of deploy with their own, uh, data sources, which we kind of understand, right. 
that you yeah. don't own with Spurs. Uh, and the third, 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 and the last, you know, piece is you know, in terms of uh, deployment or developer kind of experience, right? Uh, we kind of try and uh, focus a lot on the end-to-end -end, uh, kind of experience for the for the developers, right? And we try and integrate with their Git repos, uh, their way of kind of you know working, uh, which we don't want to kind of disturb. And I think that that makes a lot more sense, uh, you know, for them also to kind of consider if a particular tool should kind of you know fit into their uh, repository as well. Yeah. So let me ask that question around uh, customer-based GitHub repos. Uh, is there a a source control component to working with Drone HQ? Yeah. So we we provide that on a self-hosted platform. Mm -hmm. uh, where we let you, uh, you know, version so you can basically push uh, your versions. Uh, you can do source control with your own choice of, you know, any Git repos that you would have, right? Oh. And uh, and of course, when we when we talk about uh, security, we help you kind of, you know, you can deploy Drona HQ as a platform for multiple environments as well. So of course, mm -hmm. we have an inbuilt uh, environment management as well. So you can do only one installation and do multiple environments mm -hmm. uh, that you can see here. But if in case you have data sources that cannot talk to each other, they are, let's say, mutually exclusive and they are on a completely different subnet, they can't talk to each other, very sensitive data, fintech data, you can deploy Drone IHQ at multiple places. Uh, and then you can keep one as a completely development version once you are completely OK. Uh, you can push uh, into your own Git repo, uh, commit it. You can pull into your staging or your production uh, resource and only deploy, uh, post your QA and so on and so forth. Right? So, yeah. so all of these kind of things, uh, which ideally when you kind of you know sign up into a platform or on Drone HQ, you would not notice. But there's a lot more uh, that you, when you dig deeper, you are able to kind of understand how you can, you know, kind of integrate with your style of, you know, working internally as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we are having some problems with our short link system. So I'm going to edit this banner so we get folks to the right place. And it's simply Drona HTTPS Drona HQ.com. Correct. Correct. Yeah, so let's do that rather than trying to give them a short a short link that's longer. <laughs> so visit. <laughs> we won't be able to track to see how many people are clicking it, but you can visit dronahq.com to try Drona HQ for free. Now we talked a little bit about AI that that's probably fairly new, but we'll talk about the roadmap. What are some of the things that you're adding to the platform? Sure. So, um, so the one thing that you know which which we are going to have a release very soon is you know around theming. Uh, when I say theming, it's you know advanced theming. So if you look at an application, uh, a lot of times customers have been asking for you know dark mode of an application, right? Specifically, mm -hmm. you know applications that are built on the mobile device. Uh, so using themes uh, where you can customize every piece of a control that you have, right from backgrounds to fonts to font sizes mm -hmm. to scale. Uh, and so on and so forth. We are able to kind of address all of those, which we are going to you know release very soon. It's called as themes. Uh, so when I say scale, uh, it's also about what you see on the screen. There are times when people want to show a lot more on the screen, right? And I don't think a lot, many people uh, you know pay attention to that. But uh, there are times when you need an application as uh, big as this. Mm -hmm. And an application as small as you know a something something else something like something like this, right? Yeah. And you need to play with the scale of uh, the application there, right? And where we kind of minimize, you get down the font sizes as well automatically. Everything goes smaller and so on. So you have more data to fit in. So themes is something that we are uh, we are releasing very 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 soon. Uh, having said that, there are tons of uh, database, new databases that we are going to kind of introduce, including streaming uh, support as well. Uh, plus a lot of uh, uh, focus on security in terms of accessing those data sources. So uh, when you when you are a developer and you cannot connect to your own data source because you use 
vault management systems like HashiCorp or AWS Secret Manager, and you have rotating keys and so on and so forth. Right? So we are going to provide you know, those components as well, where you can hook on to your HashiCorp and then connect to your database uh, or your you know set of keys that you can kind of retrieve and, and kind of use them. Yeah. Uh, and and a lot more on on uh, managed uh, services as well. So managed storage, for example, uh, managed emails that you can kind of send, managed notifications on mobile and so on and so forth. So mm. that's mm -hmm. some of the things that are on, in the near roadmap as well. Yeah, fantastic. Well, it's a great job so far. I mean, it's a fantastic platform. It's really easy to use and it looks great. What does uh, what does the future look like for Drone HQ now? Are you looking to go public or or some type of exit? So uh, interesting question, right? So if you see when when we touched upon competition, right, we could see most of our competition is you know heavily funded. Uh, though we are uh, we are kind of almost bootstrapped as a company, so we would be the only bootstrapped company competing into this this space. So. Uh, essentially, what you know, we we want to do is, you know, uh, there are no plans of IPO as of now. We want to still grow. Uh, we are still on a high growth path, uh, mm -hmm. but we want to stay bootstrapped as much as possible. We want to uh, kind of pass on most of the benefits that come uh, being bootstrapped, being profitable back to our customers itself uh, in terms of uh, you know, in terms of pricing, in terms of our focus. Uh, not spreading ourselves too thin, not defocusing on pure growth, but actually working on things that customers need. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's that's more of you know the kind of background kind of vision that we kind of you know come up with. Yeah, yeah. So there is another question, and it has to do with the database support. Uh, other databases, I assume they're they're assuming that we you work with MongoDB, and that would be a correct assumption. But what other right. database databases do you support? Yeah, so this is, these are the list of databases that we currently support. Uh, you can also go to uh, so docs.dronehq.com, which will you know, kind of list out uh, most of the databases you know, that we work with. And you can, uh, in the reference section, uh, you can basically find them here, connectors. So these mm -hmm. are the data sources that we kind of, you know, kind of work with, and you can uh, you know, click on any of them and uh, figure out, see, you know, how do we connect? What kind of authentication modes uh, mm -hmm. and what kind of kind of you know uh, things that you can do with those data yeah. sources as well? And that was that was seamless when I was uh, playing with the the platform earlier. Um, adding MongoDB was super simple. You just prompt for the connection string. Make sure you have your your firewall rules set if you're using MongoDB Atlas and. Right. Uh, and it just exposed the data, which was was really great. So, absolutely, fantastic. yeah, absolutely. In terms of REST APIs as well, that I would want to touch upon, right? Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of our customers have very different types of authentication modes, right? And it could be as legacy as uh, NTLM authentication as well to the REST APIs, right? Mm -hmm. And or as new as uh, uh, an OAuth PKC. Uh, authentication. So mm -hmm. we kind of try and support most of the authentication methods that your REST APIs or GraphQL will be connecting to. Mm -hmm. In case you have a very complex custom method of authentication, we can connect uh, with using multi-step authentication where you can design your multi-step uh, authentication flow as well uh, to connect your uh, REST API resource or or or, yeah. or a GraphQL resource as well. Yeah, fantastic. Well, that's great. Terrific. Is there anything we've left out? Is there anything you want to share with the audience that we haven't discussed yet? Sure. So I think one thing that we did not touch upon is uh, uh, is the, the ecosystem, right? So when, mm -hmm. when our customers work, let's say with the data, right? And a lot of times they have use cases where they either want to do a, a webhook based uh, automation or a, or a scheduler, which is like a cron job, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we give you a whole similar interface that we that we provide out here, uh, so that you know you have a consistent experience of you know building uh, an action flow. And this runs completely on the servers, completely without a UI, and you can 
you know define your own ways of uh, you know running the whole the whole workflow uh, mm-hmm. or automation uh, and run your cron jobs do everything at at a single place itself and also editors that we have which are very specific to uh, you know those those sections as well so for example i want to do uh, let's take an action invoice and build a pdf template and i can i can do that as well uh, very complex pdfs that i can generate on the fly including reports uh, having said that right uh, the applications that we did not touch upon in terms of deployment are uh, in terms of how do i share these applications right yes. and uh, essentially you know while we spoke about internal tools where uh, where an employee would log in uh to you know uh to access these applications there are there are ways in which you know customers are now building customer portals partner portals uh and so on so forth on on top of our uh, dronaisku platform as well right mm-hmm. uh but having said that right an important piece where we see a lot of uh customers using it is embedding of these applications into their own portals right um and that's what we call as secure embed so when i say secure embed let's say you have already have a customer portal or your saas application where you have your your own customers logging in into and you have their login credentials and they are verified users you can mm-hmm. build widgets like uh like these right so these are these you could build widgets like these and embed them into your own saas application so it could be an e-commerce saying i want to show you my shipment tracking data now you don't need to build those from scratch you can come here build your shipment tracking widgets and go and embed them into your own uh you can pass your metadata like your customer shipment order id customer mm-hmm. id and so on so forth in a secure way and you can embed these into your own saas applications or your own consumer applications as well yeah yeah and i i wish i had asked that question earlier i mean the, one of the most important things is It, after you've developed the application knowing that it's not necessarily going to be internal only so exposing that to the outside world it right. sounds like you've got that covered in spades so great terrific right. and anything else you want to share with the audience so i think that's that's about it there are there are tons of things that you can actually go ahead and um, explore uh, but I, what i would suggest is when you sign up onto the platform we have a very good uh kind of uh you know documentation around it we have a lot of tutorials a lot of ways in which you know you can uh kind of figure out you know how to do complex things when it comes to con- concepts uh as well uh but on the platform we also have a widget here and we have a 24 cross 7 uh customer success engineering teams mm-hmm. right so in case you are mm-hmm. stuck at any point of time while building the application writing your own javascript connecting to your data source or any you know any general support that you would kind of need uh we have a 24 cross 7 you know uh support team uh which are engineering folks who can help you with writing javascript as well just drop in a message and we'll we'll be you know replying right away oh that's great that's good to know it's always good to have some backup support absolutely Terrific. Well, Divya, this has been a great conversation. I feel like I've I've learned a whole lot more about Drona HQ, and I would encourage our listeners, our viewers, to to jump on over to dronahq.com, try it out. You can get started for free. And uh, with that, I think we'll we'll wrap. Thanks very much, Divya. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, for having me here, and it was a pleasure talking to you. uh hoping to see a lot more users connecting mongodb and dronaisk together and building magic awesome likewise have a great day you too bye